All right, strategic design is over. We've gone out through all of that. We are going to talk about scouting now. And this is, I think a lot of people are here. Who's here for the scouting portion of the presentation? Oh boy, this is good. Why is scouting important? It is a great opportunity to get a leg up on the competition. Guess what? We are at the championship now. We are done. Practice matches are happening. It is very difficult to keep improving your robot. But how can you improve your performance on the field? It is by scouting and having good data. There are so many. It is crazy how many resources there are out there for scouting now. The Blue Alliance is the best thing to happen to the first robotics competition since alliances. I, might, I want to say, the website has everything. Data, match videos, things that you could have only dreamed of in the past, accessible to everyone. You can learn about your opponents and you can plan how you're playing. Also, scouting is an excellent way to get more students involved in the competition and get more students excited about STEAM and get them excited about FIRST. When I joined my first team. I tell this story often. Um, Mark Bredner, 2008 championship, Woody Flowers Award winner, was our high school teacher at our school. And we had a robotics team that seemed really nerdy. And so he came up to me, he's like, hey, I want you to join the robotics team. And I'm like, yeah, no. He's like, why not? I'm like, I don't want to hang out with your losers, was literally what I said. And he's like, no, I think you'd be into it. I'm like, no, there's no way I'm going to be into this. He goes, no, like a lot of what we, what we do is kind of like what a football offensive coordinator does or like a baseball scout. I was like, oh. Yeah, it's still a bunch of losers. I'm not doing it. <laughs> I decided to pop in and check it out. And what I saw was, wow. This is like, because high school sports, you don't scout. You know? Like, you don't do that stuff. It's just too small for scale. But like, robots, you do. And I was like, this is crazy. I can bring some real value to this. And like, this is stuff that I like doing. Like, this is like, my dream at that point in life was to be a, you know, an offensive coordinator, to be like a Chip Kelly sort of guy. And I was just like, I can do this with robots, and this might actually be fun, even though all these kids are weird and smell bad. And, but like, you can get a whole other subset of kids onto the team. And if we aren't reaching out to other communities, we as mentors in this program are failing. Because what we're trying to do in FIRST is we are trying to change the culture. And you do not change the culture by just appealing to kids who already like robots. It's about reaching outside the tent and bringing more people in. And scouting is a cool way to do it. And you can get, it, there's, just, there's so much neat stuff that goes into it. Why is it crucial? It is important because you can predict your opponent's strategy for future matches. Most FRC teams behave in very static matters, meaning they do the exact same thing every time, meaning they like to score on the same rocket, whether right or left. If you scout accurately, you can know where that team is going to be scoring, and you can position your defenders accordingly. By taking a team who always scores on the left and forcing them to go to the right rocket, you are going to lower their scoring value. Even if a team is just parking there, could make the difference between winning a match. We've seen with the score differentials, but how can you know this stuff? You can only know it with scouting. It's essential for alliance picking. Please, please, please stop picking alliances based on the rankings. I hate it. It just, it just makes me cringe. You need to know which robots work well with your robot. So it's not just having sheer data. It's seeing where they go on the field. And there's so many things you can do now. Next slide. All right, let's talk about advanced scouting, because advanced scouting has this, like, blown through the world. In 2004, uh, myself, my college room, roommate, Ian McKenzie, we were running Team 1114 back then. And we were frustrated with um, match data. All we got was scores back then, scores of matches. And we were like, try and we were using average score as a metric of team success. But of course, it was not a great metric because of alliances. And we know that your average score could be void or whatever. Like, what if there's some way of us pulling out the individual contributions of each team in the match without us being there? And so we, I was like, well, why don't we just create a giant matrix where each row in the matrix is the teams who were in the match, and the column is the amount of points they scored. And what if we had a row for every single match, and all of a sudden, and we'll go into the math of this, wait a second, that's going to be a square matrix that is invertible, meaning there is a solution. And that solution will be the 
average contribution of each team at that event to the scores. And it was just like, our minds exploded. And if we had more entrepreneurial sense right then, we would have sold that to the National Basketball Association team. Because two years later, NBA team started using a concept called adjusted plus minus. And what adjusted plus minus is, you take the five players who are on the basketball court, and for every block of time, you look at the amount of points that are scored, and you set that up as a row of a matrix. And you then have a row for every combination of players that is in there, and that gets you the contribution of the players. Not the amount of points they scored, but the amount of points they facilitated and allowed for. And this was mind-blowing in the NBA, because it took Allen Iverson, who was the highest scoring player in the NBA, and it showed that his adjusted plus minus, his teams went on the court, even though he was scoring more points than anyone of any of the 10 players on the court, had a negative differential when he was on the court. And it was showing that what a lot of people had thought, that Allen Iverson took so many shots that even though he was scoring a lot, he was taking away better opportunities from his teammates. And that was where adjusted plus minus was. And they came up with that, and a few guys like Daryl Morey, and he's the only one I can think of right now. Um, I forget the other guy's name, but he was the analytics director for the Cavaliers. I interviewed with him at one point. But they made millions on this. And Ian and I came up with the same thing for robots, except you don't make millions in robots or whatever. So we kept it internal for 1114 for a bunch of years. Then others came up with the same concept on their own, because it's not groundbreaking. It's just linear algebra. And so then eventually we started going forward with it. With it. But it is, a lot of people call it OPR because that's a stupid, catchy brand name that someone came up with. I like to refer to it as calculated contribution. You're calculating the contribution that each team has made towards the match, and not just with their scoring. So let's go to the next slide. So how we do it, I could give a whole presentation about OPR. It would be a lot of linear algebra. I'm not going to do it right now. These slides are available online on the Symbotics website. Go through it, and you can see things that you have here. But what's really important with OPR is, now, first releases so much game data. Before, you just got the final score and the teams of the match. Now, you get the amount of cargo scored, the amount of panel scored, the locations or whatever. So you can, instead of doing OPR by total score, you can do OPR by panels. You can do OPR by cargo. And you get all sorts of crazy data suddenly. And it's magical. So this year, the plunger, I was talking about them. Best panel scoring role, pure. All they did was panels, nothing else. They had a component OPR that showed that they were scoring like for cargo a match. And I showed it to someone, I was like, see, the failings of OPR. They don't even have a cargo mechanism. All this math is stupid. And I was like, it took me a couple minutes. Why did the data show this? Right, because they were scoring so many panels, their teammates in matches that were, they were paired with a plunger could score more cargo. And that's why they had that score. It wasn't because they were scoring cargo. They were enabling cargo scoring. And that is the beauty of mathematics. Because mathematics, if you looked at that robot, you would see, oh, only has a panel mech, can't do cargo, not useful for an alliance that needs cargo. However, the math will tell you, no, they're doing something else. And this is just simple linear algebra. We haven't touched on any AI or whatever in this system. But the fact that it could pull that information out, that is scary. And that is beautiful. And so like, I, when I saw that epiphany, I was just like, yes. This year, every year OPR has different value. Um, how valuable is this data? It depends on the game. Let's hit the next slide. 2019, OPR is back to being a somewhat useful metric. Why? The game is fairly separable. Teams complete tasks independently from their partners for the most part. There is some stuff that we talked about with panels enabling cargo and the such, but it's not like last year where OPR was a disaster. Because you could score one cube on the scale, or you could score 15 cubes on the scale, and it would get you the same amount of points. So as the math tries to pull this stuff apart, it couldn't. What OPR told you in 2018 was, if you had a high OPR, it showed that you were able to facilitate high scores it didn't necessarily mean you were a high cube scoring robot. It did mean that you were playing the scales intelligently and able to get advantages. 
Linear scoring this year really helps. When you have exponential scoring or multipliers, OPR, which is using linear algebra, maybe we could do a new model where we balance things off of curves and do a regression. But by doing a least squares analysis, like a least squares analysis is literally like eh, 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 straight lines linear, so nonlinear scoring messes with it. Also, there were lots of playing pieces on the field. So in games where you have fewer playing pieces, if you have three good robots on the field, they will choke themselves out. And they cannot maximize their score because they are limited by the playing pieces. This year, not so much. There's only a limited amount of playing pieces when 254 and 3310 are on the same alliance. And so as such, OPR means something. Where OPR got hurt a little bit was the climbing robots. Because for the most part, you could only get one robot on level three, especially in qualifying matches. Component OPRs are the greatest. Thanks to FIRST for providing scoring breakdowns. I also want to thank Caleb Sykes. I don't know if he's in the room, but like he is the new, I, I will take the mantle and pass it to him as the new data guru in FIRST. He has put out so much, 1114, we stopped releasing our scouting database. Why? Because Caleb Sykes' database is out there and it is better. It has so much, you can pull out his database and literally type in the event that you're going to and get projected standings that use a, a mix between component OPR and ELO, which is beyond the scope of this presentation. But like, there are so many people doing so many cool things out there right now. And there's so much data available. And it's just like, I want to thank first for having an API that anyone can tap into to grab all this data. And it's up to you to use it. And it's really cool to see how the community's done this. Also, if you can make good use of data in first, and you document what you've done with that data, you can get any data analysis job as an intern or when you graduate. And if you really enjoy this stuff, like if you enjoy this stuff to spend the time working on your own versions of OPR and stuff, then you do enjoy this, you're passionate about it, you want a job in data science and man, there's a world out there for you. Next slide. Pit scouting. I don't want to talk about it. I mean, like, it's great to get information. It's good to know what teams are doing. Please don't only rely on data. Like, OPR is great. However, actual obtained data matters. And it is important to look at things like, can I fit on the level three hab with this robot? Don't use OPR to figure that out. Go to the pit and figure this stuff out. Also. We know that a lot of teams use pit scouting to keep kids busy. And it sucks for them because they probably don't want to be doing this job and they're just doing it because they have to. But can we be nice to them when they come to your pit and not prank them and not try and embarrass them and try, not try and tell them dumb things so they go back to their teams? Because a lot of times these are kids who've just joined first and they're not sure if they want to be on a team and they're trying to find their niche. And if they go and be like, what's the top speed of, of, like, how many wheels do you have on your robot? And you answer, oh, 33. And the kid goes, okay. And he goes back to his team and says that. And then they laugh at him or they laugh at her. Do you think they're going to want to come back to the team? Like, I get it's a little bit funny. And do it to your friends. My policy is make fun of your own friends. Don't make fun of strangers. You don't know them. You don't have that relationship. The reason I can make fun of Shankar is because he's one of my best friends. That's what I do. This relationship here has been based on me roasting her for the past nine years. She makes fun of me sometimes, but it doesn't usually work. But you know, see that this is me making fun of you. I guess I don't need to be your then. You're doing the job. You'll probably be late with them anyways. But the whole thing is, this whole pit scouting thing is, is treat kids with respect. I get it's funny to have that joke at their expense. Have that joke at your teammates' expense who you're friends with and you know can take the joke. Don't have it as at some random kids because that could be like a really bad experience for them. So this is speaking from a position of guilt. This is speaking from someone who was not the best person as a high school student or a college student. So I encourage others to try and be better people than I was at that point. That was a big admission right there. That was crazy. Okay, we're coming down to the end of this presentation, but I want to talk more about scouting. So what do you do when you're match scouting? It is important to get data that cannot be obtained elsewise. And so what can't you get this year? This year you'll get a total of how many panels were scored, how many cargo were scored, 
but you will not know which teams scored them. Component OPR can give you an idea. However, OPR's biggest limitation is sample size. Everything we do in FIRST when it comes to data analysis, the sample size is terrible. We're dealing with 10 match samples, 12 match samples of distance. It is not enough data. So if you're just using OPR, that is the limitations of it. You need to collect information on how many times, scoring attempts and failures. The new modern age thing that a lot of teams are doing is cycle times. So not just looking at how many times teams score, but the amount of time it takes them from loading to score. Because then that eliminates any time they spend dancing in between. This data is very important to collect because it's going to shape your pick list, it's going to shape your understanding of strategies, it's going to shape everything. Um, other things to look at. You can tell a lot about a team if you look at more than just the scoring data. It doesn't matter anymore, but in the past, I loved, especially when it came to your second round pick list where you don't have much to go on, I loved to pick teams who were really quick at getting to their joysticks after autonomous. And you might be saying, why? Like, does that split second matter? It, no, it doesn't actually matter. However, teams that would go right to their joysticks, you could tell they cared more about winning. And what do I want on my alliance? Girls and guys who care about winning, who want to win, who have that drive. And so I care about the human player who's going to stretch before a match and who's going to take that extra detail. People make fun of this. I like to look at bumper quality. It is a very transparent thing. You see it right there. It's like when you're going on a date and you look at your date's shoes. Because you can see if someone put time into this date and if they care about their appearance. And that might matter to you. It might not matter to you. With bumper fabric, and bumper construction, if they care enough to have nice looking bumpers, they were able to get that done, that means they probably got other stuff done on their robot. And it probably put some time and detail into that. Just little things. These are the esoteric things that scouts look for. Please don't make your first pick based on bumper construction. <laughs> and please don't think you're gaming the system if you go out and create perfect bumpers, but your robot is using tennis rackets to pick up cargo. <laughs> How to do match scouting. I think you need to have at least three to six people. Some teams like the Citrus Circus have 18 scouts in the stands. I don't understand what Mike Corsetto has put in their water to make that happen. Forcing people to scout. A lot of the times, scouting is for the kids who couldn't make the pit crew and couldn't make the drive team. And that's a travesty. Because this is like a really important part of the team and it needs to be valued. If you force scouts to scout, they will come back with unreliable data. Can you imagine taking someone who's not interested in watching robots and forcing them to sit through 80 qualification matches in a day? I love watching robots. Sitting through 80 qualifying matches is terrible. Even with the best teams, it's awful. So like, if you're forcing people to scout, you will get unreliable data. So you need to find a way to make it fun. And you need to find a way to make it valued. So here's a way to guarantee that your scouts aren't going to take scouting seriously. They go through the whole day. At the end, they give you a, a binder or a USB key with all this data. And the drive team just takes it and chucks it in the pit and goes home. I've seen so many teams do that. And your scouts at that point, well, why am I spending all this time doing this and no one's even looking at the data? That is a great way to ensure that your scouts will never tr give you something usable. And when you do need that data, it's bunk. The best scouts in first are valued by their teams. And scouting is not an afterthought. And treating scouting as like a backup to the drive team and the pit crew is a great way to have a culture that doesn't value scouting. How to make scouting fun? Play games with it. I mean, on 11-14, we like to gamble. Not with real money, we made fake money, it's called Simbucks, but like, a great way to get people to pay attention to the matches and care is like, before a match, we'll be like, okay, 2056 is in this match. Will they score more or less than 11.5 game pieces? And people make a bet with their fake currency. But we don't just do it with the best teams, because that would be easy. You've got to give them an obscure team, which then challenges them to make sure they're paying attention all the time. And the people who are good at paying attention will get better stuff. Some scouts will start flipping through the data to try and get answers. And that means 
that are using the data in a useful way. And so that stuff is really, really important. I want to talk, we're coming close to the end of this presentation. I'm going to run out of time. So I want to talk about something important when it, important when it comes to scouting. We talked about it with sample size. It's tiny. So in FRC, a lot of people use average game pieces per match as a really good metric. First of all, a lot of teams don't use true averages. They just kind of like look at their best matches, which is dangerous. I like using average, but the average does not tell the whole story. Because a team could have gone 0, 0, 0, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9. Or a team could have big dips in the such. And I like to look at four values. I like to look at the team's minimum, the team's maximum, the team's average, and that's it. Yeah, average min-max is probably good. Oh, and, and um, lowest non-zero score. Because I just, I can throw up, usually when a team scores zero game pieces, usually they lost comms or something, and I can throw that out. But if I'm looking at four data points, and the team's only playing 12 matches, why am I not looking at all 12 data points? And I like having a nice visualization where I see team 1923, number of game pieces scored in each match. That visual, as much as I am a numbers person, that visual helps me to see which direction they're trending in, what their peaks and valleys are. And also, when you're planning a match strategy, I hate just going off of average. I need to know the maximum that they've scored, my opponents have scored to know what the worst case scenario is. What could we be going up against? What are we likely to be going up against? And what's the best case scenario? So that's why looking at mins, averages, and maxes matters. Oh, I had a slide on that? Yeah. When did I do that? <laughs> wow. Thank you. Did you just make that? I didn't make it. Okay. I you. Well, thank you. That's amazing. Mind blown. I do not remember making that slide. So one of the things that we worked on with our scouting was we looked at what you were talking about, but one of the things we struggled with is taking into account defense. So when they were being defended against or when they were defending and how we took that into account. That is a great question and applies specifically for this year. Do I have a slide about defense in the next one? Okay, I don't. Okay, I'll just, I'll just check it. Um, this year's game... If you just look at teams' raw numbers, there is a huge difference when a team is defended and undefended. So how do you know? So number one, it is important for scouts to track whether a team was defended or not. Number one. You could try and track how long they were defended for, percentage of the match they were defended for, all those sorts of things. But at its core, you need to know if a team was defended. So I think this is important for two reasons. One to look at teams' defended average and undefended average and compare those. Two, for trying to pick a defense spot. It is hard to figure out who is good at defense, but the best way to do it is, I like to look at a defense spot, what they did in a match against a very good team, and I would like to look at what that same very good team did while they were undefended to see what that delta is. I've been working on trying to create some new metrics along this line, where you basically create a baseline for a team, and then you look at how defense bots affect teams' baselines to try and get an average amount of game pieces denied as a metric. Um, I think that is a cool goal for everyone in this room, all the data scientists, and to see what you can come up with. Um, I know there are some teams who are out there who have come up with stuff. They're just keeping it proprietary right now. I'm not keeping anything proprietary at this point, but I'm just saying that I still haven't fully captured the magic of it. But I do think at a base level, take the defense robot, look at them against good teams, and then look at what the good team looks at undefended. But that requires your scouts categorizing when a team is defended and categorizing that properly. I brought up the 771 example from Provincials, and I mean, they took Team Dave from being one of the best scoring robots in the world and turned them to an average robot. Why this is really important as well, so this year, okay, if you, I don't, I'm not going to phrase it with a stupid hypothetical, I'm just going to tell you. Um, a lot of teams always think you should send your defense robot after the best robot on the alliance. That is a mistake. 
teams fall into that trap. But the best team on the alliance is usually the best team because they're also the best team at scoring while under defense. I like to go after the second best scorer because usually they're the ones that you can bring their average down the most. There is a reason we sent 771 after Team Dave and not after 2056. People thought it was crazy to leave 2056 undefended. They went and did 16 cycles. It was really impressive. And they lost. But because we went after the weak link. Think about wildebeest in the wild. When a lion is chasing the pack of the wildebeest, the lion does not go after the fastest wildebeest. The lion goes after the slowest one, the one with three legs. Even though their meal has one less leg, they're going after the slowest one. And thank you. We are running overtime at this point, folks. So I, if anyone wants to leave at this point, that is totally cool. I will not be offended. I understand if you have places to be. I'm going to keep talking until someone kicks me out. Oh, OK. I'm being kicked out. Um, <laughs> that's how that goes. OK, I really want to wrap this up. But like, remember, don't always defend the best team. Let's go blast, blast, keep going. Alliance selection, oh, I can't believe I missed this. Um, when you're doing alliance selection, just remember, trust yourself and no one else. If a team from another division comes to give you advice for alliance selection, they are there to mess you up. They are trying, they're looking after their own self-interest. Do not trust teams outside your division unless you know them really, really well. Championship brings out a crazy cutthroat amount of competitiveness from some teams. I'll tell you one story, the worst story. There's this one team, I won't name them, but at one point, they didn't want to talk to a team about alliance selection, so they had one of their kids pretend he was deaf. <laughs> Actually happened. And that other team, for the next two years, thought this kid was deaf. <laughs> but every year at championship, there will be a team, especially if you are not expected to be the number one seed in your division, and you seed number one, you will suddenly have all these new friends offering you advice. Guess what? Most of them are not your friends. Be very, very careful. Some of them, this happened in Canada. One of the, oh, no, I can't do it. I can't do it. We're running late. Next slide. Not important. Skip, skip. Can we go to the last slide? If you're going to remember anything from this presentation, remember those two golden rules. Scouting is the easiest way to make your team successful at a competition. Each first match, we didn't talk much about strategy, but I think what's really important is you're all passionate people. You all have goals. Take what you've learned in this presentation and take it forward and figure out how you can improve your team the best. It may just be that you are now the subject matter experts and you are taking this information forward. This video is going to be available on YouTube. It's going to be available on Twitch. Have lots of people watch it, learn from this stuff, but also, Nothing great was achieved without enthusiasm. You guys have the enthusiasm. You can do great things. I will close this presentation off with a quote from one of my old economics professors. Before our exams, he would always say, I, could, I would wish you good luck, but that would be a waste of time because luck isn't a real thing. So instead, I will wish you success. I wish you all success this weekend. I wish you all success as you go on with your high school careers. I wish you all success with your lives. Good luck, everyone. I will be available if anyone has questions up at the front of the room.